Good evening, everyone in Australia, and good morning to those of us joining from the UK or Ireland. I know we have people from all around the globe this evening, which is very, very exciting for us here at the VLGA, LG Pro and LGIU, working in partnership to bring you this evening's session. My name is Chris Eddy. I'm the interim CEO at LG Pro in Victoria, and it is my pleasure to moderate this evening's live panel session. Before we commence, I would like to just say, in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, VLGA, LG Pro and LGIU acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Before I introduce our panel, I'd like to uh, introduce firstly Catherine Art, the CEO of the VLGA, to say a few words of welcome on behalf of the VLGA. Good evening, Catherine. Thank you, uh, Chris, for that introduction. And I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us for a very special end of year live panel episode of VLGA Connect, brought to you in partnership with LG Pro and LGIU Australia. We are privileged to have with us tonight or morning for those of us joining us from the UK and Ireland, a panel of CEOs from across the globe speaking about the impact of COVID on the business of local government. For those of you who don't know, the VLGA is an independent governance organisation, a peak body for local government, and our five-year strategic plan, which ends in 2022, guides our work, and we work to support and assist councillors to do their job well and support councils in achieving good local governance in the delivery of services to their communities. Before I hand back to my co-host Chris Eddy to formally introduce the panel, and as 2020 draws to a close, I think it's a good time to reflect on what has been a most challenging year and is still a challenging time for many of us. However, as difficult as this year has been, it has also defied, defied us and the sector to work harder and smarter to continue to deliver the high caliber resources and support that you expect of the local government sector. And as an organization, the VLGA has developed agile and responsive content and methods of delivery to accommodate new ways of working. Advocacy for effective local governance supported by training and professional development opportunities is at the heart of what the VLGA does. And we also give councils a voice through regular meetings with key stakeholders, policymakers, the Minister for Local Government, and by hosting collaborative and informative panel sessions like the one we're about to hear tonight. I could go into the many things that we've done this year at the VLGA, but I don't want to take up our time. It's precious, and I do thank you all for joining us, and I'll hand back now to Chris to introduce our panel. Thank you, Catherine, and just may I say on behalf of the LG Pro, it's been a pleasure to collaborate with you on these sessions this year as part of the LGA Connect. And it's a pleasure to bring into the fold this evening for the first time, LGIU Australia. And I'd like to introduce Luke Nichols, just to say a few words to establish uh, LGIU. Luke is the lead here in Australia. Luke, good evening to you. Uh, thanks, sir, Chris. The, um, I'd just like to welcome you all as well. The, uh, and just, uh, I mean, all the UK and, and Irish councils know LGIU very well. Um, and we've been spending the last year extending uh, the service to, to Australian councils. Um, and there's been a lot of councils involved right across Australia now, and the service is, is, uh, has been established quite effectively in Australia. So, um, but it's not necessarily a brand that's as well known uh, for Australian councils. Um, and we just wanted to, uh, I suppose, the main ambition for uh, LGIU to expand into Australia is so that it develops up that global sharing of ideas and solutions uh, for local government to allow you to better serve your community. So um, the expansion of the global network is, is really critical to, to what we've been trying to do. Um, and it's really great to see an international panel with such great um, council CEOs talking about their experiences and sharing them and then councils across Australia and also across the LGIU network being able to share the, um, those experiences. So um, very much looking forward to tonight uh, and uh, um, I, hope it, uh, I hope there's something controversial or exciting that comes up that one of the CEOs raises. So back to you, Chris. 
Thank you, Luke. More of the exciting, less of the controversial, hopefully, but we'll, we'll go where it goes. Thanks very much, and it's a pleasure to be working with you. So let's uh, move on to the uh, substance of uh, this discussion this evening or this morning, wherever you are. 2020 has undoubtedly been one of the most challenging years for local government in living memory, as it has been perhaps for everyone. As we look back on the year, it's time to reflect on how the closest level of government to the community has met the challenges of continuing to serve communities effectively under extraordinary pressures. We're privileged to have with us four experienced chief executive officers to talk about how their councils and communities have responded this year and to look at what's next as we contemplate what life will be like on the other side, if you like. I'm just going to very briefly introduce uh, our um, CEOs and come back and talk to them in more detail in just a moment. Anne Doherty, the CEO of Cork City Council in Ireland. Hello, Anne, and welcome. Kelly Grigsby, the CEO of Wyndham City Council in Melbourne. Hi, Kelly, and welcome back to VLGA Connect. Jim Savage is the CEO of Aberdeenshire Council in Scotland. Hi, Jim, and thank you for joining us bright and early there. And Kerry Robinson, OAM, the CEO of Blacktown City Council in Sydney. A pleasure to meet you and have you with us this evening, Kerry. Welcome. So, Anne, I'm going to start with you firstly, and a little bit more about Anne. Anne is the CEO, as I said, of Cork City, has been since 2014, has over three decades in senior management roles, including the Health Service Executive in Ireland and the National Health Service in the UK. In 2014, Anne was recognised as one of Ireland's most powerful women by the Women's Executive Network. And it's a pleasure to meet you, Anne. I wonder if you could start perhaps just by setting the scene for our audience on where you're at currently in terms of the COVID journey of 2020 and moving into 2021. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good, good evening, good morning, uh, as appropriate to, to everybody on the call. And thanks for the opportunity to join with a great bunch of uh, colleagues around the world. Um, so we, I'm from Cork City, uh, just by way of orientation. Cork City is uh, the most beautiful port city in the southern of Ireland, right down at the tip. Um, it's Ireland's second city, very outward looking. And uh, sorry, Jim, I'll have to say it, but post Brexit, it will be the uh, second largest uh, English speaking city in Europe. Um, so we have a population of 210,000 people. Um, I have 31 elected members and 1500 staff. On an annual basis, an operating budget of about 260 million revenue and about the same in capital. So that's just, just a little bit of a scene setting. So in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, from a COVID perspective, we've done reasonably well. Um, in Cork, uh, we've had low numbers of cases, but obviously as a small country and especially as an island, uh, we have been through two lockdowns, uh, one in March and one that's just uh, finished uh, in terms of the we're at now, it's called level three, uh, which means that our uh, restaurants are open with uh, kind of a restricted service. Our bars are closed unless they're doing food but from a local government perspective we're on full kilter all our services are open we're operating um you know 100 plus actually at the moment because and we'll come back to it chris uh, there was a lot of central government support for local government in terms of stimulus packages to do things to support the citizens from a COVID perspective from a, from a citizen's perspective, I suppose the open space, the, um, the whole uh, psychology of COVID was very, very important. And I suppose also from a staff perspective, you know, right back at the beginning, none of us really knew anything about it. As you mentioned, Chris, I have a history in the, in the health service. I've studied pandemics. Uh, that was a great thing to do, but being living in one of them is a completely different thing. Um, and we all have fears and anxieties and family issues that, you know, and I think that that's been really important as the employer and how you mind your staff, but also mind your citizens. I suppose very proud of our public service in Ireland. Um, we definitely all pulled together. Our local government may be slightly different to some other colleagues on the call. We don't run the health service or the education services. I know other local authorities do. Uh, we have a big role in economic development and community it would be a mm. big, big part of our, of our backbone. I hope Chris, that gives a flavour. It certainly does. And there's, there's quite a few things in there I'd like to unpack if we have yes. time over the next hour or so. Just for scene setting, uh, here in Australia, we're just coming into summer. Of course, it's the opposite for oh, you, which probably is giving you a different uh, 
phase of this uh, this virus too, pre-vaccine, yeah, I assume. Yeah, although interestingly, I mean, seasonal flu was flat this year if for us. Um, obviously, there was, um, around the world, there's been an issue, obviously, with normal flu, vac if I call it normal flu, vaccination, although it has, uh, we have been able to source as a country and we've had a high uptick in flu vaccine. So normal flu is flat, which is interesting. And to me, that's about hygiene. It's about the etiquette that has COVID has brought to everybody. From a COVID perspective, we as a country had over about 430 cases yesterday. Now, I know that can seem small, but for us, that's kind of like, you know, we've been down at the tens and 20 cases during the summer when we came out of our first lockdown. So there is concern from a public health perspective and uh, like everybody, you know, we're heading into Christmas. And as you know, in Ireland, we do love our families and we do love to party. So that's a little bit of a concern for everybody, especially our public health people. So there is a concern that we're going to see a lot of growth in numbers. Um, our schools are back since September and that's been really important. Uh, our, our, our primary and secondary schools, our um, universities mostly have been online um, since September, and that's been challenging. I think for all of us, and I don't know what the other panelists think, young people have, I think, had a really tough time in this, and I know we worry about the older person and their vulnerability, but young people, I, I would really be concerned about. We've done some stuff on that that I can talk about. Before I give you a quick rest, am I right in from what we've been seeing on the news, other parts of Europe are perhaps doing it worse than what you've described there in Cork with lockdowns and it take them through Christmas, etc. Have I understood that yeah. correctly? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, Brussels, or sorry, the, um, yeah, some of the other European countries seem to have yeah, been going through some big, big struggles. And even some of the Northern European countries, uh, which had done really well in the first round of this, have really had trouble this time. Um, so it's very hard to know. Obviously, for us, um, whilst we're an island, we are part of the European Union. We have open borders. And, you know, there's a lot of debate constantly about flights in and flights out and whether we should or we shouldn't, you know, the usual stuff. But we are part of the European Union and that's something that's very important to us. Um, and so that openness of, of movement of goods and people has been kind of the backbone of that. Um, we do have um, arrangements in place that if people visit our country that they do uh, need to voluntarily isolate. There's a lot of debate about whether or not testing pre-travel, post-travel, you know, the, the same stuff is going on all over the world. Um, obviously, Irish people, uh, as uh, people all over the world, love to come home for Christmas. So it's been a real balance for our government just to say, you know, this year, could you kind of stay where you are and don't come yeah. home, which yeah. would be a real anti, <laughs> be something yeah. that would be a bit alien to us. But it did happen apparently back in, I think it was the 60s when there was a foot and mouth outbreak. Um, in, in, um, and they did ask at the time that Irish people wouldn't come home and they didn't. But, mm. you know, that was, that was a very different time. Thanks, Dan. Have a, have a breather there. We'll That's come back great. to you. I've got a lot of questions from, from that, but I'm sure, uh, more importantly, our audience does too. So if there's things you'd like to explore from what Anne's mentioned, uh, please pop your questions in the chat. So I'm going to come to Kerry Robinson, the uh, CEO of Blacktown City Council. Kerry is... Um, has been in that role, I think, since 2015, am I right, Kerry, or yeah. some, some, 2013? Um, and his resume includes broad experience in town planning, valuation, real estate, property development, and local government, has held senior private sector roles, and has taught at the University of New South Wales. And in 2019 was awarded the Order of Australia for services to local government and town planning. Pleasure to have you with us. Kerry, good evening. And perhaps if you could just set the scene for what life is like for you at the moment in Blacktown and some of the challenges that you've been dealing with this year. Uh, so just very quickly, we are a uh, large suburban council on the metropolitan fringe of council in a growth area. So we have a population of 400,000 people over about 247 square kilometres. We have a staff of 2,200 odd doing traditional um, service delivery. Uh, we have a budget of about $800 million, which is about 450 GB pounds. Um, and we've got a very large capital program for delivery of about 2 billion pounds worth of growth infrastructure uh, to service the 250,000 people that are moving into our city uh, with the fourth largest council in Australia. Um, the context in Australia is very, very different to the UK. Uh, we've been through uh, a single shutdown and then uh, some suppression, if you like, 
and have now virtually eliminated the, the uh, COVID from the country. Um, and what we're dealing with is the tail of imported COVID from travellers arriving, um, and that is very, very restricted. Um, our borders are effectively closed other than government-sponsored flights. So the context is, is very, very different. Um, I'll leave it there, Chris, unless you want to yeah. just go a little deeper, drill a little deeper at this stage. Uh, look, we might we come to that through the course of the conversation, Kerry. Just, um, I'm not great on Sydney's geography, others probably are, but we've had a couple of cases in the news from Northern Beaches. That's nowhere near Blacktown, is it? Uh, no, we're in the very western part of the city, but um, the cases move, um, if you like, broadly. The uh, hotels, which are quarantines, are in the centre of the city. The lowest paid workers live in the fringe of the city, and it doesn't matter whether it's the north, the west or the south, those workers go in, those cleaners, those, those uh, HR people, they go into those areas and they bring the disease, unfortunately, back out to suburban areas. So uh, it, it can be anywhere in the city. Kerry, one thing I wanted to explore with you, if we have time, is with your development background, uh, we understand the New South Wales government has uh, invested a lot of stimulus spending into infrastructure, which uh, you're no doubt experiencing Blacktown. How's your experience, your background helped with that sort of really fast get it going on the ground type environment? So you might have thought that the real estate market would grind to a halt because of lockdown and all the rest of it. But in fact, the fact that money is virtually free with reserve bank rates of 0.25%, and um, with Commonwealth stimulus, so first home buyer grants, in fact, suburban greenfields land is doing very, very well. So we still have residential estates which are selling um, 20 lots a week. And so there's still a lot of turnover. Our development applications at that end of the market are flowing very, very well. Um, so stimulus is countering what might normally have happened uh, to a shocked residential property market. And what strikes you as the biggest impact in your particular municipality when compared to others, Kerry? So just broadly in terms of scale of impact, at, at the outset in March, we did a Ford forecast looking at various scenario. We picked a middle scenario and said over 18 months, we thought we would have a revenue shortfall of about $24 million. As I look back now, so far, the revenue impact's been about $5 million. Um, the, the most significant impact has been in our aquatics business. We run a very substantial learn to swim business. We typically have about 8,000 people um, on our learn to swim books at any one point in time, and that's a money maker for us. Um, there have been other lesser impacts in terms of uh, inability to book community facilities and things like that. Um, so in, in an operating budget of about $400 million, to have a hit of $5 million is for us very, very manageable. Um, we've, we've dealt with it most fundamentally by simply holding vacancies for a minimum of nine months um, in order to, to create a, a, a staff saving, if you will. We've all at the top of the tree taken a salary cut. And other than, and they're the two biggest things, and the remainder has been sopped up simply by deferring small amounts of capital works. So compared to what the US, compared to what the UK might be needing to address, for us, it's really been a mild impact that has been very, very manageable. And, and we've had extraordinary support from our staff in doing that. Terrific. All right. Um... We'll let you have a breath and come back to you very soon, Kerry. I'm going to move on to Kelly Grigsby, the CEO of Wyndham City Council in uh, Melbourne. Kelly's been the CEO there since 2015 and has extensive experience in the local government sector at councils including Brimbank, Colac, Opway and Glenelg, and has also worked as an organisational management advisor to NGOs in the Solomon Islands. Can you just set the scene for us? Wyndham, uh, one of the fastest growing councils in the entire country, but uh, you also had one of the highest numbers in particularly in Victoria's second wave outbreak, didn't you, of cases. So um, you've had a pretty unique experience on the ground there as well, haven't you? Um, we have, as you say, the unenviable really position of being um, one of Victoria's hardest hit, in fact, the country's hardest hit 
councils just in terms of COVID infection rate. Um, however, as you say, we are one of the fastest growing cities and I was just um, listening to Kerry's um, address just now and the similarities uh, are really striking. You know, we have um, we did a very similar thing in terms of our financial forecasting and, um, and put a lot of those things in place that Kerry's outlined at Wyndham as well. And we're pleased to date that, um, you know, our income isn't as affected as we we first envisaged. However, we do see that, you know, that is likely to be as a result of the stimulus packages as Kerry's outlined, but also JobKeeper and so on and so forth. So we do think that there will still be, you know, quite a significant hit um, to, to, you know, the economy locally, but that will be a slowed um process probably uh, for us here in Wyndham. One of the other key characteristics, of course, of our city is that we're one of the most culturally diverse cities in the country as well, and in fact, one of the youngest populations. So we've had, um, you know, some unique challenges, but also some terrific opportunities. We're a very entrepreneurial city, and we've had some fantastic businesses, you know, really pivot and become really agile during this time and, you know, continue to trade um, in new and different ways, which I'm sure we've seen you know, across the country, but certainly from our perspective, that's something we've been particularly proud of here in Wyndham. Um, as you know, um, in Victoria and certainly in Australia, um, we don't have direct responsibility in the local government sector for health. However, during this time, I think local government has really played a critical role in working very closely with the Department of Health to scale up appropriate services. Um, here in Wyndham, of course, we scaled up our own GP um, um, contact tracing service really in an attempt to sort of trial and pilot some different ways of managing that um, in you know what essentially was a, a hotspot area across our city and we did that um, through a partnership with GPs that grew and grew and grew and now of course we're working with DHHS on rapid testing to sort of look at how we manage you know future outbreaks um, in a you know more agile way and um, containing those particularly as they relate to particular geographical areas or particularly um, you know community cohorts so one of the the things that I think local government has done particularly well and I'm sure this is worldwide um, is that it has scaled up really important services being the closest level of government to people we know our communities well and I think that's one of the key learnings from my perspective that I hope has come out of this um, pandemic is the role that local government actually plays particularly as it relates to you know how we engage with culturally diverse communities for instance and the fact that central government don't necessarily have that reach um, nor the expertise sometimes um, in working with diverse communities. So I think local governments really come to the fore in that regard. And certainly that's been a really central part of Wyndham Council's response is really being able to work closely with community leaders from interfaith communities, um, but also with our health sector as well at a very practical level um, to really start to scale up um, really innovative approaches to not only testing, but also that wraparound support to ensure that people had the right, um, you know, access to service, access to support to isolate in a safe way, um, recognising we were dealing with people with large household sizes, um, people in insecure workforce settings, um, and of course, um, just needing to make sure that, you know, we had bicultural workers engaged um, at that level to ensure that people were able to access those supports available and that it was, you know, a, a wraparound uh, sort of approach rather than, you know, the kind of naming and shaming scenario in terms of we've got COVID positive cases coming out of these communities, these settings, you know, how do we manage that? So it, it's been, I think, a, a real testament to the local government sector and the way that we've been able to scale up not only those approaches as it relates to health um, management in that sort of, a, you know, more acute sort of pandemic um, response setting, but also in terms of, um, you know, scaling up service like our community kitchen and ensuring that um, we were able to really meet those needs as they were changing in a really dynamic way, particularly in those early stages of March. We scaled up for that level of response. We didn't get the level of, of sort of wave that we we're expecting, but that work that we did in those early days certainly 
placed us well to respond when we did get those really significant increased infections in that second wave. So it's terrific to see Victoria coming out of this now, um, but we can't be complacent. And I think that work that we continue to do alongside and in partnership with government and other agencies is going to be really critical to take us forward. Thanks, Kelly. A few things there I want to come back to if we have time, particularly around those challenges of communicating with the, the diverse community that you have your contact tracing, and if I recall correctly, back at the outset, you were doing some things with technology that others hadn't quite gotten up to speed with yet to, to get the word out. So um, just on notice that I'd like to explore a couple of those with you if we get uh, if we get time, Kelly. But we've got Jim Savage waiting very patiently to introduce Jim, the CEO at Aberdeenshire Council in Scotland, and has been in that role since 2015. Jim's resume includes experience as a teacher, a management consultant in the defence and utility sectors, and over 20 years in local government in the UK. He's the immediate past president of the Peak Body Solace Scotland and chair of the Scottish Resilience Partnership. And I'd love to find out more about this, Jim, clerk to the Lieutenancy for Aberdeenshire. Welcome to VLGA Connect, Jim Savage. Good morning, good evening to you all. Hi. Jim, uh, set the scene for us there in Scotland, and I don't mean the fact that it's only just breaking light at the moment and you're at that end of the year where you don't have a lot of daylight, but, but how, is, uh, how is it on the ground for you right now? Well, I'll tell you a bit about Aberdeenshire and then about where we are in terms of COVID yeah. just now. So uh, Aberdeenshire is uh, the fourth largest administrative area in Scotland. We've got about 263,000 people in terms of residents. From a council point of view, I have 70 councillors. I have uh, 16,000 staff, uh, 172 schools, uh, revenue budget about £600 million and a capital budget of about £130 million. It keeps us all quite busy, all in all. Jim, I just saw a few frowns from those who've got cameras on you. You did say 70 councillors, didn't you? Yeah, 70. Yeah. I love every one of them. Absolutely. <laughs> So in terms of area, um, uh, very diverse economically, uh, uh, a lot of oil and gas, a lot of uh, fish processing, a lot of agriculture, a lot of tourism with Balmoral here as well. Um, uh, a very uh, sort of a stable and a sort of cohesive community across the board. Um, a sort of, uh, and in terms of COVID at the moment, to nudge onto that one, we're still in the trenches just now. So we're right in the midst of dealing with the pandemic. So quite a contrast to other colleagues on the call so far. What does that mean for you and the way you're delivering your services in Aberdeenshire and your staff, for example, at the moment? So if I go back to the start of uh, uh, sort of uh, in March when we went into lockdown, there had a huge amount of change for, for services. A lot of them stopped. We redeployed staff into key services. So a huge focus in terms of childcare hubs, in terms of care, in terms of waste collection. I moved staff from leisure across to health and care, which we got joint responsibility for with the NHS locally. Um, I moved staff from roads and landscape across to work uh, in terms of waste, to work with local undertakers, uh, very sadly and unfortunately. Um, we move many uh, staff on a voluntary basis to open up childcare hubs to support key workers. So a lot of flexibility and agility. Um, we've invested a lot in technology as, a, as an area. And so we went from a few hundred people working remotely to 4,000 people working remotely overnight. Uh, and we had the IT infrastructure to be able to do so. Um, all of our democratic systems continued on. So all of our committee meetings, our council meetings went straight online. Um, I've used my emergency powers pretty little through this uh, sort of year because we just kept on going in terms of normal business, but in, in a very different way. Uh, we've got a bit of a hallmark. I think as, a, as an area uh, and as a, as a council of just stepping up and doing whatever is needed. So uh, all of our staff, um, very local, they know their communities. They just get on with what's needed to be done in that respect as well. Uh, so really clear direction from us, from a council, but locally, day to day, staff just get on with it in that respect. Uh, big focus in terms of the more vulnerable and most vulnerable. So a different uh, profile in terms of risk and concern. So social workers, another example of areas being really key for us in terms of making sure people are safe and looked after and supported as well. Um, so workforce wise, that was that lockdown back into a bit more normality, came out of that one and people wanting their grass cut, wanting the bins emptied, wanting to see the, the streets weeded in the midst of a pandemic. So that was quite a challenge doing that. And as I said, we're just coming into another wave now in terms of more COVID cases. 
And so that's been quite tough for us. Uh, just a couple of weeks before Christmas, going into another stage of lockdown tomorrow. Uh, so we're having to close some of our leisure services. We've now got more travel restrictions coming into place and hospitality is closing at 6 p.m. with no alcohol served at all. So our environmental health officers are going to be busier just making sure that is happening here. And some quite big outbreaks more recently in terms of some of our home care and residential care settings uh, across the Shire. Uh, one of our independent providers has had 102 cases just recently in terms of COVID just within their, their location. So tough yards at the moment, really. Uh, and I think it's been a really long year for people, people needing a bit of a break, but that personal and organisation resilience really is still being called on at the moment. Uh, yeah, look, our thoughts go out to you, Jimmy. It does sound like a tough, uh, a tough environment to be in right at this point in time. I, I'm interested in a comment you made back uh, uh, a couple of minutes ago about moving from um, a couple of hundred people to a few thousand online virtually overnight. Clearly, you had a pretty good IT or digital infrastructure already in place. Am I right? We've made the investment. We're a big sort of a, a dispersed rural area, as I said, the fourth largest administrative area geographically in Scotland. You know, I far prefer to see my staff um, having an extra hour of life and uh, give me getting an extra hour of work every day rather than having to commute all the time. So I don't care where they work. You know, I just want to get a job done in simple terms. So we've got a great push in terms of flexibility and mobility of working. So rather than commuting to certain offices, just go and get on with it. And so we've put our infrastructure in place to enable that flexibility working to happen. And it's come up trumps for us now. You know, it's been beneficial for us to be able to see staff, to be able to work in that agile and that flexible way as well. So the foundation's been good. We've also invested in public infrastructure in that way to be able to give a backbone for trying to push broadband coverage out into our rural communities as well. So if we invest in private developers, we hope we're going to piggyback onto that as well. So there's been an economic and an industrial hit as well as it being from our point of view as an organisation. Catherine, I'll come to you for audience questions in just one moment. I just want to pick that theme up with Anne Doherty, if I may, because I think, Anne, your story about that capacity to move into an online environment. It's a little bit different, if I remember rightly. So our city is a very compact city. We don't have big commutes like Jim has described. So there was never, I suppose, the, the motivation to, to look at maybe working as differently as the pandemic and the stay-at-home orders put before us. So for us, obviously, number one was resilience. So we did all the, team, like everybody else would have done, team A, team B, prioritizing your emergency responses, all of the water infrastructure, the things that you, the, the must do's. So we very much prioritized them at the beginning and making sure that they had the remote capacity to deliver their service. And then we were we were left with a gap, um, which was a challenge that we've addressed it now. Uh, by the end of quarter one, I'll have 900 people with capability to work from home um, as required. So what we're seeing from staff is that they're preferring a more blended solution so that it is um, some in out office and some out of office. I suppose for us as well, it was about transacting with our customers. Uh, we moved 50 services online very, very quickly. Uh, again, why didn't we do it before this? I suppose it's back to, uh, you know, sometimes I suppose all of us, we, we're comfortable in what we're doing and, so, you know, to have a disruption like COVID um, has some positive outcomes actually as well because it forced some of those things to happen that we'd been talking about. Um, mm -hmm. But definitely, I suppose, as well at the beginning for us, um, it was different to some of the colleagues on the financial challenges that they faced. Our government did come out quite early with a, a rates waiver scheme. So for me, 42% of my income comes from commercial rates. So having certainty around getting that would have obviously been really important. So what we did, um, we've a good interagency across all the state agencies in the city. We would have looked to redeploy people to the health service quite early uh, to support contact tracing as Kelly spoke about. So we didn't do it. We got staff to go and work with our colleagues in the health service and also some other parts of the health service because they were struggling. And then also we redeployed a lot of people. So our city is 187 uh, square kilometers now. That's only in the last year. Prior to that, it was 37 square kilometers. 
So a lot of our population live in the 37 square kilometres. So when the stay at home rules came in and exercising was within two kilometres, our public spaces got really challenged. So we redeployed an enormous amount of people, about 150 people to be uh, social distance rangers in our parks. And so suddenly you were working in payroll or in, I don't know, in another transactional role in an office space and you were a park ranger and staff were fantastic. And they were out there every day supporting communities. It was just that presence to help people with it. So they were the types of things we had to do, Chris. But the technology piece, like COVID was disruptive for us, but it has put us in a way better space in terms of our digital um, engagement with our citizens. Sure. You mentioned the right waiver scheme. Am I right that no. uh, you, were, you were required to implement that, but the central government actually... Uh, gave, gave that money yeah. back to you yeah yeah, yeah. so, so we've um, um, 47 million in in in, uh, in rates waiver as, a, as an organization so that was huge i mean compared to what kerry or and i know jim has spoken about previously when we were chatting on another day you know having to look at now we have had to do some um cost reductions but we've been able to manage them with efficiency rather than having to put a coach and horses through the services and that's been great not to have that worry and central government did early on recognize obviously business needed support but they did listen to the fact that local government would keel over if it didn't give that support to local government and i think that was a bit of a game changer in terms of that relationship with the central government that recognition can I just explore, I'm sorry, Catherine, um, just before we get off that, so Kerry, perhaps, has your relationship with the state government in New South Wales changed this year as a result of COVID in any meaningful way? Um, I might reflect on some of the conversation and just how different it is here in New South Wales. So New South Wales has had a very top-down state directive model, both for healthcare delivery typically, but also particularly in COVID. So the public health orders put in place by the state have been policed by the New South Wales Police Force and Council has no role in the administration of that. Um, in terms of uh, helping out, as Wyndham might have done, in terms of engagement with the community, the health service in this state has been very directive and very top down. So our biggest impact was we had a childcare centre which had uh, a couple of cases in it which was closed down. So we'd done all of the work, prepared our strategies for how we we're gonna deal with all of that. And they meant nothing because the, the health department stepped in and said, this is what you will do, this is when you will do it, and this is how you will do it. And we're gonna do most of that in any case. So to some degree, we've almost been an observer to what has gone on within the community. We have mm -hmm. a long-term relationship with the health district, but that's much more about long-term strategic um, alliances and the, the way we approach community more than any actual direct service delivery. So, so we, we haven't been involved very much. In terms of the IT piece, we were just very lucky that in February we completed the rollout of a new standard operating environment where we'd given everyone laptops. And we thought, this is fantastic. Except that, like Anne, we'd not had a lot of work from home going on, so we only had 100 external VPN ports. So there was, for six weeks, a, a, a technical glitch where everyone had these laptops at home, but they couldn't actually access the network. Some very, very tricky um, software was developed by our guys to manipulate that to give us 600 external ports, which is as much as we needed for everyone to work from home. And... Um, we probably peaked at 75% of people working from home, but even at the worst of the pandemic in our state, which was not very bad compared to what uh, Jim's dealing with, there were still 25% of people in the office. Um, there are people who have family situations, family mental health challenges, addictions, all sorts of things, which mean that they simply do not or will not work from home. Mm -hmm. And so we were very flexible in accommodating that. Uh, in terms of your specific question, in terms of relationship with the state, um, our legislation means we're not able to defer rates um, and the state didn't step into that space. But our deferral, so typically we have about 4% of, sorry, we're not able to waive rates. We are able to defer them. We typically carry about 4% deferred rates. That's gone up to about 6%. Nowhere near what we budgeted for. Um, 
the job keeper, the, the Commonwealth job subsidy in Australia has meant that the vast majority of people in the community have kept their jobs. I think our unemployment rate's gone from about five to about seven and a half odd percent within the city. So really, once again, very, very manageable impact. Um, relationship with the state, uh, Chris, um, a little more engagement with the central part of the Department of Planning, uh, Industry and Environment, which looks after local government, but not very much at all. So it, it's it's been very much business as usual for us with small impacts along the, along the way. Thanks for that, Kerry. Catherine, um, I am mindful we have some questions uh, building up in the chat. Thanks for that, Chris. And I think we've covered off a couple of them actually during that conversation, there was a question about the move to online and what the impact of that was for councils. And we've talked about that from um, a staff perspective, but also a service delivery uh, perspective. Um, I know, Jim, and you may wish to comment about this, the financial assistance um, that the central government has offered um, in Scotland has, well, certainly when we caught up a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? the level where it was in Ireland, for example, and that has potentially significant financial impacts for you. Um, I'm not sure if you wanted to, to comment on that. A slightly different position for us. Um, uh, I, I would say that the uh, different countries have already had a different financial hit uh, economically in terms of how COVID has been. You know, I, I, the Scottish government here, um, I think, along with the rest of the UK, has uh, probably had a harder time comparatively, if I can make it say it that way, in terms of the level and extent of COVID. So uh, financially and economically, it's been a, a very long time now in terms of intervention. Uh, we have had an impact of about £60 million budget pressure, so 5% equivalent, um, due to loss of income, additional expenditure, and a lack of uh, sort of revenue coming in in some shape or form. Uh, we have uh, sort of uh, stopped spending in some areas, so we've uh, uh, reduced that pressure down by about £14 million, pounds, and otherwise classy looking in terms of how we can reshape and reconfigure services just now. I haven't had our budget settlement yet. That's going to be next January. So just at the start of actually a voluntary redundancy process with our, our workforce at the moment, right in the midst of all of the response going on, which is really tough uh, to do at the moment, but we have to balance our books at, at just now. Um, and we wait to see what the uh, sort of settlement will be next year. There, ha there um, is uh, and has been a loss of income scheme coming through for some of our commercial activity, which is welcome and beneficial. Um, but we wait to see quite what a settlement will be. And as I said, I think sort of a, a UK and Scottish governments are both uh, having a tough time in terms of the amount of investment they're having to make to be able to navigate COVID just now. And will be a part of the consequential effect of that all in all. So um, could be worse could be better, uh, we'll just get on with it. And, and perhaps, um, as you said, you're about to enter a next stage of, of lockdown um, this evening over there. Um, that might also inform some of that decision-making um, by, by the government in terms of what that assistance might look like and possibly might force um, the hands there. One of the things that I'm also yeah. interested in hearing from the panel about is, uh, I guess, and particularly um, from Anne, Anne and Jim, where you have, and I think you said 31 councillors, Jim, you have 70. Um, um, Kelly, you have 11, I think, or, or um, and Kerry, I'm not sure how many you have, but certainly in Victoria, um, we had an issue at the beginning of, of the COVID sort of uh, restrictions where the legislation, the Local Government Act, didn't allow for the councillor group to meet virtually. And that caused a little bit of angst at the time, uh, probably perhaps more so for, for the councillor group themselves than the CEO where the legislation does actually allow for the delegation of um, most of you know, the responsibilities of the councillor group to the CEO. Um, but the state government in Victoria passed an omnibus bill to actually allow for councils to meet virtually um, sort of into the lockdown period. How, how are your councillor groups meeting or operating um, and perhaps their roles and responsibilities are slightly different to those that we have here, but really interested to hear the panel's reflections on that. Um, so we um, so we have 31 elected members and they would work across five electoral wards in, in the city and from within them they each year elect a Lord Mayor who's the chair of council. 
and we have very clear executive and reserved functions. So the council's role is statutory in terms of the adoption of the budget, the corporate plan, disposal of property. Yeah, those type of things. And a lot of the, the stuff is with the executive. So when um, the first lockdown came, we were in trouble because um, there was no provision for online statutory decisions to be made. Um, and there was this whole piece about how do you manage bringing large groups of people together? So our public health people did um, uh, give guidance that we could meet for, to conduct the statutory business, uh, but we had to have the two meter social distancing and all of the other health checks and cleaning, and that it could not exceed one hour 55 minutes. Uh, that was the hardest part of it, <laughs> was keeping it to one hour 55 yeah. minutes, because there was definitely a huge frustration with the elected members that they weren't able to have the debates. And, um, you know, that did cause tension with me. They called me the COVID police because I'd be gone. That's it. All out. It's, you know, time's up. We did then move to an online weekly briefing with them about what was going on, but that had no statutory basis. Since then, our government has also passed legislation now that provides legally for statutory business to be conducted online. However, having said that, there's still a huge appetite among the elected body to actually meet um, so we had our budget meeting recently, so our 21 budget has been passed and it has been, you know, just listening to Jim, like we've had to increase our local property tax, we have a 5 million hole that we've had to do some cost efficiencies, but we've produ produced a balanced budget that's been approved by them, but they wanted to physically meet for that. So we did a lot of online stuff pre the public meeting to get, yeah, so it's been a blend. All our other committees have gone online, all our SPCs, our local area committees, all of that now is online. It's been a big change for them. And after we had a council meeting the other night and it was four hours online, I was ready to jump out the window and I'd say hello yeah. to 31 other people with me. It was hard, very hard, yeah. Jim, have you got some insight? I will ask each of the panel members just to provide a comment on how they've managed the elected reps in this environment, Jim? So a lot of these things were in our gift and our power. We weren't dependent on a, a government to enable us to do that. And we had most of the uh, uh, sort of arrangements in place in terms of delegations and authorities. So we'd already started to um, sort of experiment where councillors were not able to attend because of a medical condition. They were able to dial into a meeting and take part and vote, et cetera. So we had all of that in place. So pretty much overnight, we just split to online meetings. Uh, and it's most amazing experience seeing our provost uh, silver chair full council which is a four or five hour meeting going through all of our normal business with 70 councillors all on there till Microsoft Teams meeting and getting on with it. Uh, I think they've experienced the upside of that, of the lack of travel activities, so just more productive in terms of time. And simply, with the, it's, everyone's just a sort of um, uh, existing on, online in that respect as well. The intensity of that environment can be hard in terms of the whole day sat at a screen. I think as we've all experienced. And so there was still that desire to come and have that interaction, that face to face relationship as well. Uh, I think important, though, as well, not just in terms of focusing on a council, but our councillors have just provided such great community leadership throughout the whole of the pandemic uh, and just staying in touch with all of their communities. We've had a huge community response in terms of people looking after each other uh, and being immensely strong uh, as an area in that respect as well. And so we've been using technology in that space as well of just making sure we're staying in contact with people, community councils working. And so it's, it's focused both ways in that respect as well. But I do think people, like Anna's saying, uh, at some point in time, are just going to welcome them chance to be able to sit down with each other to have a chat in a corridor and just have that interaction yet again in overall yeah. terms so we have functionally done it and business has continued but you can't take away from just standing next to someone as well so that's what it's been like for us kelly i'll come to you next did i hear right that very early in the piece your councillors had a meeting outdoors in the car park at one point as a way of continuing to work face to face we did, Chris, and this was um, as a result uh, in the first stages really of uh, the issue that we had with the legislation as Catherine outlined. So we did, uh, we met in the car park using social distancing measures um, and, of course, the meeting wasn't open to the public and, and still hasn't been. We've used a mixture of both um, teams meetings, um, but as soon as we could get back together for face-to-face -to -face ordinary meetings of council, we did resume those. Um, now that we're post-stage four lockdown, lockdown, we have been back um, running our strategic briefings and certainly our councillor induction program on site 
Um, look, the, the use of technology, um, our councillors were terrific, really coming up to speed with that technology quickly. Um, we were in a very... Um, fortunate position that we moved very quickly to provide online services. We literally had staff off site um, in the matter of really over a weekend. We had the functional capability to be able to do that. We didn't have the same sort of challenges that some of my colleagues have talked about, both in an Australian context, but also in the UK. Um, so we were very fortunate in that way. And one of the innovations that you talked about earlier, Chris, we put a lot of effort in March early on to scale up a website called Windham Together. We knew that the arts industry were particularly going to be hit hard and we also knew people were going to go into isolation and be, you know, stuck in their homes. So we really wanted to create that sense of we are in this together. So we, we set up a website, we curated a whole lot of content from around the globe, but also still continue to commission artists as we would have normally with our performing arts program, our galleries, our exhibitions, and provided some really unique content online through our Wyndham Together website, um, as well as continue to run virtual events. And I'd have to say we'll continue to do that into the future because we had just such a huge take up um, in the arts and cultural program that we otherwise wouldn't have had. So many more people visiting our virtual gallery, of course, many people really are uh, joining into that program. So that's something that we'll continue to do. And of course, um, telehealth and other services like that, we took advantage of during that time as well. But really, we only had out of a staff of around 2000, at, at most of the time um, since March, we only had direct service facing staff on site those that really needed to be providing those critical services. We even scaled back um, our works crews. We rostered them in different ways, um, but most people were able to work off site and from home, um, and most are still doing that. We're now in a process of transitioning back, of course, but really applying a future of work methodology to that. And um, we'll be going back to a hybrid model um, really from February onwards, which we'll see a portion of the workforce continuing to work from home, co-working space, but again, our interest is working with government and other agencies and key, um, in, you know, industry leads to make sure that we can keep as many people working and living in Wyndham as we can because we've got a large portion of our community that, of course, commute into the city. This is obviously the antithesis of what the City of Melbourne are trying to do. They're trying to drag people back in. We're sort of wanting to create opportunities for people to actually still work yeah. um, from Wyndham. So looking at those co-working partnerships so people don't have to work from home home if they haven't got those suitable arrangements to do so, but indeed provide that sort of, you know, MOU type arrangement with key industries and certainly government agencies to keep people in Wyndham and create, you know, a, a wonderful polycentric city um, for our community. So that's our focus at the moment. Thanks. I took a bit of leverage there, Chris, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Some good insights. And I think your dog would like you to toss the ball. Uh, and while you're doing that, I'm going to come She to... was quiet before until I start speaking and then she goes silly. <laughs> I'm going to come to Kerry Robinson just for some observations on that, that topic around the elected representatives and managing those council requirements in the COVID environment. I'd have to compliment the Office of Local Government, the state agency here, that they did uh, get a regulatory amendment in, which meant that we could run uh, meetings remotely. Um, like each of you have said, um, our councillors absolutely loathe it, being political animals. They just do not want to not have a face-to-face -face debate about things and have those conversations. So. We had about two months of uh, remote meetings. Uh, our meetings have been closed to the public. They'll be open from the first round of next year. Um, and our community committees have been online, but because of each of those is led by a councillor, um, they're all coming back to face uh, hybrid, face-to-face -face and remote. And, mm. and hybrid is basically where we are headed. The, the, there's lots of uh, writings about the whole uh, work from home and work in office. And a lot of that writing is driven by what's readily measurable and the innovation that comes from being together isn't easily measured and gets underweighted in the academic writing. And I think it's, it's so important to work out the hybrid model, which to take Jim's point, means that people don't have to commute all the time, but allows enough interaction so that you get that innovation 
that change which comes from that casual water cooler conversation. That's just so important. Uh, Catherine, any questions from the, I've got a stack of questions here, so we're not going to run out, but I want to make sure we cover audience questions if we can. Uh, yes, look, there was a question here, and, and uh, I think if I paraphrase it, it's more around, you know, what's the impact of COVID? How has that reshaped the delivery or the opportunities for the role of local government? Um, and it might be easy, well, I guess all the panel can comment at the various different stages of COVID, but, but, but what are those opportunities you think for the local government? How do you see the COVID pandemic changing the way in which local government works and even the type of services it delivers? Uh, a couple of thoughts or three things. Uh, I think our experience has been that this has helped bring out the best between central and the local government rather than having the usual turf war about who's responsible for what. We've found our place to each do what we best can do in that respect. Um, I clearly uh, think there's going to be an economic and social impact on the back of COVID, which we are yet to see fully. Um, and I would anticipate that we're going to be putting more work and effort into um, economic recovery, supporting people uh, who are going into unemployment in terms of reskilling and retraining. Uh, and more broadly from that, I think there's going to be some really interesting work for us to do in terms of uh, social confidence, social cohesion, uh, community resilience, community capacity, which has been great all in all, but this is going to really whack people. Uh, so th there's really quite a nebulous thing in terms of actually how do we continue to build that community resilience up uh, and I've got an open mind in terms of what that means we're going to have to do as an authority all in all. But certainly recovery and econ uh, economy are going to be a huge focus is in some of the skills agenda as well. So a lot of work with our local colleges and universities to be able to make sure our young people people uh, I think has touched on before don't miss out on opportunities as a result of COVID just now as well so quite some changes for us in terms of emphasis and focus. Jim what does that mean for the role of your elected uh, representatives do you think your councillors? We've done a, a, a huge piece of work called a community impact assessment where we've gone out and spoken with a few thousand uh, so people across the community uh, and have really got under the skin in terms of how COVID has affected them and what's uh, been difficult what's been the upside if there can be such a thing and what they need mostly from us or from themselves at the moment and we'll do that exercise again uh, sort of all in all and so that I think the role of the local councillors is to ever more um, be those strong voices within and for their communities and to really understand what is going on in every single community across the space so that we can be super clear and super focused in terms of what our priorities need to be. Uh, so I think that advocacy uh, and that um, representation is, is so significant and it's never been so important as now just at the moment. So for me, that's fundamental. And mm. secondly, the ability to starkly prioritise. You know, there's going to be some tough decisions to come ahead for us in terms of budget and what we do or don't do as an organisation. And sometimes trying to find the right balance in that moment will be tough. So some pretty difficult challenges for them ahead. So a bit of steeliness, I think, will be another part of the, the need for them as well. So just saying if Anne, Kelly or Kerry have anything to add to that, Anne? I think, um, I think it's been a bit of an aha moment in terms of... Um, how important local government is. Um, I think for uh, for other agencies in our city, there was, you know, my gosh, you know, you're so flexible, you're so nimble, you can do stuff with, you know, I think that was really important. But I think also from a citizen perspective, you know, when, when lots of other people were gone home, local government was still there and that kind of public sector ethos, I think was really important. Mm -hmm. I suppose for us, I would agree with Jim, I think in terms of change, I think um, our role in economic recovery and the community resilience are the two places that we have huge amounts to offer so for us just as an example we engaged psychologists very early on in our recovery thinking not that we, I think it's even not even call it recovery it's just like how do we cope with the next phase of this you know and it was all about getting getting all the people around the table talking about you know what's the most important thing to get business back up and running and actually it was safety the customers that came back to our city felt safe 
And that was a bit of an eye opener for everybody because normally it's, you know, different things that people think about in their business. So it was just even bringing those type of conversations. And we did a big Reimagine Our City program, uh, but we did it from the ground up and it was sitting down virtually, obviously, uh, with um, the different streets by streets, uh, the businesses, the people who lived there, what worked, what didn't. You know, so we were able to progress things. We've pedestrianized 14 streets that would have taken 14 years probably to achieve um, because of, I suppose, we were all probably working a little bit differently differently because we were far more engaged with each other because of the nature of it um, also for us um, you know we were able to have an ambition that we'd have a thousand people could dine in our streets um, over a couple of months and we achieved that with business and you know society has really responded to that because that's the community piece that people felt safe with and I think as well um, you know our role in community development is not always understood and it's not about taking over, it's about empowering and creating the conditions for communities to grow. And I think that's been really important in this. And I think that's that they're the things that I think will be our future. It's, it's uh, yeah. probably echoing Jim a little bit there. But we're going to have to start wrapping up. So, uh, Kelly, maybe just one minute on that topic of what do you think will change for us? Look, I, I just concur with a lot of what's been said. Um, first and foremost, I think, again, just that role of local government, I think, is much better understood, as Anne's just said. I also think the practical examples of the reduction of red tape, you know, we talk about projects to reduce red tape. The reality is we've seen this in action when it relates to, um, you know, the pedestrianisation, tactical urbanism that we've seen um, that, you know, local governments really led on to support business reopening um, restaurants and and creating those active spaces back in to our city centres. Um, I think that these are the things that really will come on as being terrific opportunities that we can build from. But I think first and foremost, it's the role that we play as a leader. And I think that the New South Wales model and why it was probably a bit more top down there was because their government works quite differently, I think, in a district or sort of regional context. Whereas in Victoria at a state level, it's very much head office sort of driven, certainly in the metro context. I think very different model. And I think there's an opportunity for us to really look at decentralisation of government in partnership with local government to deliver these sorts of services into the future. I think my experience, and I'll pick up on Jim's comment about the import of advocacy. In, in a pre-COVID world, half of my time is spent outward facing in advocacy. And it's been extremely challenging to do that because the state, and that's mainly with the state bureaucracy, the state bureaucracy is pretty much shut down. So everyone's working from home in order to take the load off the public transport system and not have the disease spread through the, the 5 million people in the city. Um, it's been very, very challenging uh, to, to continue with that advocacy. And I go back, back to my comment about innovation. Mm. Teams meetings are great. They start on the hour, they finish on the hour, and you have none of the valuable conversation that you have at the start and the finish, which is about building those relationships, which allows you to call on those relationships to yes. get leverage, to get stuff done. Yes. So that's sort of the biggest thing that we've confronted. Um, I, I, I'm sort of hoping that that goes back to a degree of normalcy, um, but there will be far more ongoing working from yes. home. Yes. Um, certainly, our politicians have have very much missed the ability to be of the community, to be in the community, to be engaged with the community when uh, the social distancing stuff has precluded that. We haven't done our normal community workshops and so forth. Uh, we have got some council, we have 14 councillors, that's all. Um, some of those have health vulnerabilities, so we've been very cautious about opening up too quickly and getting that level of engagement with that direct engagement with the community. I want to um, finish up uh, calling on you with uh, a question without notice. So I'm just looking for personal reflection now. As leaders of large organisations, of a lot of people dealing with challenges this particular year, what have any of you learned yourself about the way you lead and what sort of personal reflection do you take out of 2020? So I suppose for me, um, I worked in the health service for 34 years. I've been in local government for six. So I suppose when you know a crisis happens in the health service, it's all hands on deck. 
and I suppose personal fear, and I have a clinical background, so the personal fear bit maybe was, I had to learn very quickly that not everybody was right up on my shoulder with that. So I actually had to stand back a bit and be far more thoughtful about, you know, where the staff were at as well, because having worked in acute hospitals, you know, it's all in. Um, so that was one for me personally, uh, that um, I, I always thought I was good at bringing people with me. And I hope I still am, but I had to do a check on myself early on mm. on that one. Um, so that's a, person, a very personal reflection. Uh, from, from an organizational perspective, I suppose I'm just dead proud of us um, uh, because I think that people did go above and beyond. And, you know, when all the personal fear, you know, we did put arrangements in place. We did, you know, I send a weekly text message now to all the staff. We do a weekly call with the what I call the group of the hundred senior managers. You know, we kept communication, communication, communication has become so, so important. Um, and I suppose then the other piece is, you know, that um, as I think uh, Kerry said, I do think that the innovation bit we need to mind we need to mind where magic happens and magic happens where minds come together. And um, so for me, it's about how do we keep that um, in this kind of world? Now, having said that, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to talk to you all this morning in this way, only for COVID probably. Thank you, Anne. Kelly, I'm going to come to you next. Have you learned anything uh, insightful about yourself this year, do you think? I think so. <laughs> it's been a challenging year for, for everyone. And um, certainly from my perspective, I think um, I've learned to really value sort of research. Um, you know, I'm an evidence-based sort of person in any case. But I think early days of COVID, um, you know, I think some of us kind of saw what was coming a bit like Anne said, perhaps before some others did. So I I think I quickly learned that I wasn't going to be able to convince people by just saying, here's what I think is going to happen. But in fact, you know, I really did a lot of quick research um, across the country, across the globe, more specifically to look at, you know, what was happening and sort of try and be, you know, I guess, evidence based in terms of leading that change. And um, that's really how we approached it from the outset. But again, just the importance of communication and probably I'd underestimated the impact that I have as a leader on the organisation. That was probably a big learning for me, I think. Um, I realised suddenly people were looking to me very quickly um, to lead the way through this, obviously with support from a very competent, um, terrific team of people. But yes, the, the buck kind of does stop with you and it's, mm -hmm. That was probably a, a moment of, of realisation for me early days when we needed to start to make some of those really quick, um, difficult decisions. Jim, a personal reflection from you, perhaps? The importance of nurture uh, for the organisation. So one of the things I've done is uh, each week have a, a team call with a few hundred staff, just jump on, and I just talk to people about the latest of what's going on and what uh, I'm dealing with in that respect. And I think just the candour and the accessibility has been important. And it's the whole gig in terms of the difference between the person and the post. So people have seen more about me as a person. Um, they do seem to be more interested in terms of how my six month old uh, border collie's doing than me at times, but that's <laughs> part of life in that way. So I think just having a bit of openness and just treating people as, as human beings and attending to that uh, as an organisation, I think has been profoundly important. And I think doing more of that, as Kelly touched on, is my big learning from this year. Thanks, Jim. And there's many, many pets that have become uh, much more well-known than they normally would be this year. Uh, Kerry? A reflection, we've got an exceptional work health and safety leader who's worked all around Asia. And his connection has, was really, really strong in terms of bringing the science and what the UN was saying and a whole heap of things to the organisation to say, this is what we think the future looks like, which was really, really helpful. In, in terms of the leadership, um, just a reflection on the import of stability. So people in the organisation look up the tree and they want to see that there is strength and there is stability. And we've got an, a fantastic working relationship at the executive level, um, we were meeting daily as stuff was evolving and all the rest of it. And just the consistency of messaging um, and the solidity of the way we work together um, gave enormous support to the staff that we knew what we were doing, we were looking out for them, we were looking out for our community and it would be okay as we went along. And, and I suppose that, re that reflection on um, just being stable, being calm, being sensible, um, is invaluable to people. 
Thanks, Kerry. That's been terrific, uh, those insights from all of you. Uh, I could speak with each of you for another half hour, hour individually, uh, at least uh, on these topics. I hope our audience has gained as many insights from this as I have. I'm going to ask Catherine to perhaps uh, sum up for us. Thank you for that, Chris. And I know he could probably well talk for another hour or so, but we won't let him tonight. Uh, we'll, um, and, and for our um, overseas panellists, I know you've got a day to start. Um, I just really wanted to acknowledge the contributions that you've all made today and, and the honesty and the reflection and certainly um, sharing those, those personal learnings is, is very powerful um, for, for those in the room. Um, it's an incredibly challenging period, I think, and I feel for you, Jim, and, and also Anne, who are perhaps at different stages to where we are in Australia, and we certainly hope that, that some of tonight's this discussion here may, um, you know, help you through, you know, the next few months as, as you sort of go into the, those different stages. Um, COVID has brought about opportunities like this to collaborate and bring people together. And certainly that has been not a learning for me so much as an, an opportunity for, for our organisation, for the organisation that I lead, to bring those, those people together to have those conversations and to through, use virtual platforms like this to really touch as many people as we can. And I think um, VLGA Connect has been very successful in doing that. I must thank Chris Eddy, who's collaborated in his capacity personally and also as interim CEO of LG Pro um, to Luke, I think he may have left us from LGIU. We, I have met um, the global head of LGIU uh, previously. Um, don't think he's in the room, but I see that Andy Johnson is um, from the UK LGIU office. And I'd just like to thank LGIU for also collaborating on this. I think you know, this is about the more of us in the room having these conversations, the more of us that are collaborating, I think the more learnings that they, there will be and, and the, the support that we can offer the sector will be strengthened. Um, so thank you and um, I wish you all the very best. Thank you, Catherine. I can see Andy there. Hi, Andy. Thank you for being with us. So that wrapped it up. Thank you very much. I hope uh, that's been a useful session. We're getting some, some nice feedback there in the, in the chat session. Thank you for being part of another VLGA Connect special live panel. We look forward to hopefully seeing you all again in 2021. Thanks and good night.